This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hi, it's Jeff Ratliff with the Neurology Podcast and Thomas Jefferson University. For today's podcast episode, I'm speaking with Louise Klebanoff, a neurologist at Cornell University in New York City. Louise is a co-author of a viewpoint piece that was published in JAMA Neurology online this past February and was titled, Modern Neurology Training is Failing Outpatients. In this article, Louise and her co-author outline the decline of true general neurologists and the implications for both neurologic care as well as the landscape of residency training. Louise, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much. I'm really happy to be here. Louise, our listening audience is largely comprised of clinical neurologists, both general and subspecialized, as well as our neurology trainees and residency and fellowship. And this piece points out that there's a declining number of general neurologists available to care for patients. Can you teach us more about what is the current state of general neurologists in clinical practice, and what are the implications for patients with neurologic disease? I mean, what we've seen over the years is that increasing number of residents are going into fellowship training to pursue subspecialty care, which is fabulous. However, that does leave a deficit in terms of people who are available to take care of the vast majority of patients out there with neurological problems who really don't need a subspecialist. As more people subspecialize, there's just fewer physicians who are familiar with general neurological concerns who could take care of a broad spectrum of these patients. So in drilling down a little more, you point out that this loss of general neurologists seems to be coming from the residency training culture, the systems themselves. And and I'll quote the article and say that you mentioned that, quote, modern neurology training is now framed as a step along the path to fellowship rather than a way to train neurologists ready to graduate and serve the needs of community patients in the ambulatory setting, closing the quote. So can you talk more about that? What do you think has changed about residency education such that graduates aren't going to serve these communities of patients with neurological disease that would be best suited by a general neurologist? Well, it always seems that over the past, say, 20 to 30 years, the number of fellowships has just exploded. And residents are really encouraged to use their initial neurology residency as a stepping stone. I know when I'm interviewing resident candidates, we're always asking them, what are you going into? What are you going to specialize in? as if neurology in and of itself was not a specialty. I think people are encouraged to subspecialize, and then I think they lose their skills in taking care of the global patient. And so thinking about it a little more, the way I see it, and full disclosure, I'm a residency program director, are residency training programs coming up short in one of two ways? Are they maybe coming up short in not adequately preparing their graduates to go straight into general neurology practice? Or is it an alternative that maybe they're failing or coming up short in fostering or supporting enthusiasm and interest in a career in general neurology without the need for a fellowship? Or is it a little bit of both? You touch on it in the article that some of the language changes about how we refer to general neurology and a little bit about the structure of residency training in general and how that might be contributing to these issues. Besides what you said, that there are more subspecialty fellowships available out there than there were a couple of decades ago. I actually think both things are true. I think um, residents are not necessarily prepared to do outpatient general neurology when they finish their residency. Residency programs, especially those in the urban setting, those settings, residents are really necessary to provide inpatient care. Their exposure is very heavily weighted towards inpatient medicine. And people are going to be excited by and encouraged to go into things that they see. If their outpatient exposure is limited, why would they go into it? They don't see enough of it. Um, So I think the residency needs to be restructured. Also, I think if we are just constantly saying, well, this subspecialty, that subspecialty, and not elevating the general neurologist as a respected component of the treatment team, 
that's also an issue with our residency training. In thinking about being a residency director and also a, a fellowship director, I know that, you know, speaking from my perspective, and I, I don't think it, it's unique per se in that our listeners might identify as folks who are general neurologists, but they're subspecialty trained. I know I've had fellowship graduates and residency graduates who have gone on to do a fellowship and then ultimately did that still as a means to joining or building a general neurology practice. And the most salient example that I think of is, is trainees who go and do a fellowship in neurophysiology and may offer additional neurophysiologic testing within the scope of a general neurology practice. And so I, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts of that path as a means to meeting this need for general neurologists, or are we still you know, potentially sending too many graduates of residency programs into practices where they're only seeing patients within the subspecialty realm that they were trained in as fellows? I actually think doing a subspecialty fellowship and combining it with general neurology makes perfect sense. I think that can be really satisfying and add, can add a layer of expertise to what you're doing in the outpatient setting. I think neurophysiology is a perfect example of that because many of the patients you see in general neurology might have the need for having an EMG study or having an evaluation by someone with more expertise in neuromuscular disorders. But those individuals can also see general patients that don't necessarily fit in their subspecialty. From a practical standpoint, many of us need to do some sort of subspecialty work to have a procedure because procedures are reimbursed at a higher rate. And from a practical financial standpoint, it's often helpful to be able to interpret EEGs or do EMGs or do Botox for chronic migraine. So I think there's definitely a role for combining fellowship training with general outpatient neurology. And we've touched on some of it already in terms of how we can celebrate our general neurology colleagues and view that career as a pinnacle career, just as we would with someone who did fellowship training as well. And you wrap up the article discussing some possible ways forward. And so what are some of the avenues to help bolster this pipeline of general neurologists? Is it happening at the residency program level? Are there things that accreditation bodies can do, the ACGME or the ABPN can do to bolster and, and support the population of general neurologists? Given what you've taught us about the scope of the problem, what, how can we start to move towards a solution? I, I think there are definitely things that can be done to encourage people to pursue a career that can be quite satisfying and fulfilling that's in general neurology. I would love to see a primary care track in neurology residency programs, similar to the one that's often offered in internal medicine. So you can identify people who really have an interest in ambulatory care and partner them with the appropriate mentors so that they really get adequate exposure. Um, I think we need to improve and increase the amount of ambulatory training that the residents get. They have a six-month requirement, 40 continuity clinics a year. That could be bolstered. I also find that the ambulatory care training for many of our residents is often an add-on or a distraction from what's considered to be their primary work, which is the inpatient work. I think they need to be released a little bit from that burden of inpatient care so that when they're in the outpatient setting, they can really focus on their patients and give them the attention and the importance that ambulatory care requires. So I think there's actually a lot that can be done through changing residency programs to improve that. I also think we need to involve our general neurologists in more teaching for the residents and have our residents really spend more time in outpatient settings that have a more diverse and interesting patient population. Our resident clinic tends to be focused on the Medicaid patients that tend to have a higher psychosocial burden. And I think that's a very challenging patient population and gives our residents a bit of a warped perspective of what life is like as a general outpatient neurologist. I think those are all really good points, and I'd be interested to sort of look at training programs, and they're probably 
are models out there of how those clinical curricula are structured. And maybe there are programs out there that are fostering enthusiasm in careers in general neurology, you know, better or differently than, than other programs. To finish us up, and I'd like to finish the podcast conversations with some practical advice from experts that we're talking with. How does the article that we're talking about influence or adjust the conversations that we're having in the clinical spaces? If or when a patient asks you, hey, should I see an epileptologist for my seizures or should I see a neuromuscular specialist for my myasthenia gravis? How do you talk with your patients about the importance of a general neurologist in the care of the conditions that you're seeing them for? What I see is bread and butter neurology on a daily basis. That means headache, neck pain, back pain, dizziness, cognitive impairment, and gait disorders. Those are the primary things I see. I would say that my internal medicine colleagues, if they have a patient with a neurological symptom, are not entirely sure who to send them to if all of their neurology colleagues are subspecialized. What I bring to the patient is a global perspective where I could do a global intervention, a global assessment, and see if they actually need subspecialty care. As a general neurologist, I feel really comfortable managing most problems, especially when they present. And that's when I t what I tell my patients. If they have a seizure disorder, for example, if it's relatively simple, they're on a medication that's well tolerated, they have no side effects, they're doing great, I can continue to manage them. If we're getting into trouble, medication is failing, they're having side effects, they're having breakthrough seizures, I've tried a couple of things on my own, then obviously I'm going to pull in my subspecialty colleagues. My job in part as a general neurologist is to tee up the patients for the subspecialists. Our subspecialists are often have very limited clinical time. They're doing more research or do, doing teaching in their subspecialty area. If I'm sending a patient to them, they've at least had their preliminary evaluation, they've tried one or two medications, and then the subspecialist can really take on the more complicated patients. And that's frankly how I present myself to, to my patients. I think that's helpful. And I think, you know, obviously that model and that role modeling for our trainees, circling back to the earlier conversation, I think is is really valuable as well. And and what is the role of the general neurologists and and what is bread and butter neurology that our residency graduates should feel comfortable and competent and enthusiastic about about managing. I've been speaking with Louise Klebanoff from Cornell University about her Viewpoint article in JAMA Neurology titled, Modern Neurology Training is Failing Outpatients. It was published online on February 27 of this year, and I would encourage our listeners to go check that out and read some of the commentary and arguments that are made there. I think it was really enlightening. And Louise, thank you for teaching us today on the Neurology Podcast. Thank you so much, Jeff. I appreciate being here. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology Podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes, where you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology-specific topics you want to learn about. The views and opinions of the participants in this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of the Journal Neurology or the AAN. Disclosures of the participants are included in the show descriptions reached by a link on the neurology.org website.